Hello students, I hope you are enjoying various applications which can be done using different type of protein microarrays. We have got exposure of variety of platforms and different type of applications which are possible by using protein microarrays. I am going to give you a glimpse of another type of clinical application using human proteomerase. I will focus mainly on the brain tumors. So, let us talk today about autoantibody screening in brain tumors. But before I come to the workflows, I would like to tell you that when you have variety of samples from which you can do proteomics investigation, especially in the clinical context, then you can choose different path, different technologies to address different type of biological questions. Here I have shown you two different paths, one essentially to look for the most abundant antigen screening, which one could do either using the gel based platform or using mass spectrometry based proteomics. Alternatively, especially for various type of biofluids, one could use protein array platform and look for the autoantibody detection. Of course, on the same samples, one could obtain more complementary information and all of that could contribute towards the systems level information. If you recall from my very beginning lecture, when I talked to you about different technology platforms in the field of proteomics and how field is going to progress more towards system biology, I think we have to become very unbiased and appreciate variety of technologies and what kind of new insight they can offer from the same type of clinical samples. In this manner, it is important that we should understand that which technology, which platform can provide what kind of unique insight. So, this work what I am going to describe today essentially proteomics based investigation of brain tumor focus on the autoantibody screening. This work was done in collaboration with Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, where we obtain variety of clinical samples from the patient, its tissue, serum, plasma or cerebral spinal fluid. All of these kind of samples provide some unique and interesting information. And as I mentioned, you can now decide what is the biological question you want to address and accordingly you can choose different type of platform either mass spectrometry based or gel based proteomics investigations or using protein microarrays which I have shown in the middle panel here that the discovery phase could be done using variety of platform from the proteomic technologies. But eventually it comes the validation and validation one could do either using antibody based approaches or one could also use the mass spectrometry based new assays which are coming forward especially based on the selected reaction monitoring where you are not involving antibodies and directly measuring the concentration of a given peptide or protein using mass spectrometers. Again the entire field of mass spectrometry based proteomics and targeted proteomics in itself is a full content for the course. But here I am kind of trying to give you the balanced view that how you should be applying the same samples to understand different type of questions by applying on different type of technology platforms. So, question is can we identify the autoantibody signatures emerging from the brain tumor patients? This is one of the very uh, interesting hypothesis where many uh, reports and many publications they have reported that in addition to the autoimmune diseases even a different type of cancer autoantibodies are uh, emerging from the uh, patient samples. And especially in the cancer the autoantibodies are generated against the tumor derived proteins which are either absent or barely detectable in the normal tissue or in response to the post translationally modified proteins. These autoantibodies appear in the blood serum or plasma much before the complete establishment of disease in many cases. So, one could actually use them as a early detection biomarkers because one could do the testing uh, from the blood with a routine kind of blood based test which people usually do for the health checkup. So, protein microarrays provide one of the strong platform to look into these autoantibody screening from the patient's serum or plasma samples. 
So, as we have seen that protein microarrays they offer variety of applications and different ways one could make the arrays and finally, use those protein array platform which is essentially the miniaturized uh, arrays when you can print your proteins or your CDNA and you want to make the proteins from that which could be utilized for many applications. But biomarker screening using autoantibodies is one of the very important application which is we are going to focus today. So, as I mentioned the onset and progression of cancer often results in expression of mutated and aberrantly expressed proteins which could act as the self antigens. Now, these self antigens they evoke an immune response which leads to the production of autoantibodies. Here I have shown you a workflow how to use human proteome arrays for detection of autoantibodies. Just keep in mind that when we are talking about a human proteome arrays one could either use the purified proteins or use the cDNA NAPA based approaches. In this case we are using purified protein based arrays which is consists of almost uh, 18,000 human proteins printed in duplicate. Idea is if we add the patient serum sample we can detect unique autoantibody signatures against the tumor antigens using protein array platform. Of course, while assay looks very uh, straightforward and simple, but data analysis and further data interpretation becomes very challenging. Here I have shown you the workflow for autoantibody screening using protein microarrays. You can think about a similar experiment which you have done using western blots. Exactly same concept is here except that you do not have a membrane you are talking about the protein arrays on the different substrate especially on the glass or nitrocellulose membrane. All the proteins are printed on the chip first you want to block your slide so that all the uh, other region where proteins are not printed they should not give you the uh, background. The blocking can be done either uh, milk dissolved in the PBS or you can use the super block. Once blocking step has been done then now you can use the arrays where you can add the patient serum sample and think about we are talking about very uh, thin glass slides where you can add even simply 10 to 15 or 20 microliter of the uh, patient serum sample which is diluted in the uh, buffer and therefore even hardly with 200 microliter you can cover the entire slide. Idea is that these patients uh, serum sample contain antibody against tumor and if these antibodies are produced then can they bind to the antigens which are printed on the chip. So, we have 18,000 human protein antigens printed on the chip and these antibodies which are part of the serum sample once they come on the chip can they come and bind and if they are binding then one could try to detect those antibodies using secondary antibodies which is anti-human IgGs linked with the Psi 3 or Psi 5 or various type of Alexa fluor, uh, fluorophores. So, the idea is the primary antibody is coming directly from the serum sample and secondary antibody you are adding either anti-human IgGs or IgMs and then further you can detect the signal with any different type of detection strategies. So, so far I think you, you got a glimpse that doing the protein array based experiment is not very difficult and you do not need a lot of you know big setup and big instrumentation uh, in any standard molecular biology lab these experiments can be done. But when we talk about high throughput experiments you have to keep in mind that these experiments have to be done very meticulously and lot of attention has to be paid that what kind of data are you going to get. High throughput does not mean that you know you can get uh, data in a very high quality in a very very short time. High throughput requires lot of attention lot of you know careful thoughts that how well your experiments are proceeding is the data what you are going to generate is of high quality and can we rely on that data. So, in this slide first of all if you have the printed slide you would like to make sure that protein is actually printed properly or if you are using NAPA array so proteins are expressing properly. So, if all the clones which you have printed uh, eventually which from which you made the protein if they contain some tag for instance the GST tag or uh, MIC tag any other tag. Now, if you can uh, use the antibody against that so all the features where the protein has been printed or protein is expressed then one could test out from the antibody. In this case 
first we want to test on the human proteomerase uh, which we uh, collaborated from the Johns Hopkins laboratory in US. So, these arrays contain the purified uh, protein and, and each one of these clones contain the GST tag. So, as you can see on the slide that first we want to make sure that wherever the proteins are printed those are all showing us the signal which is coming from anti-GST antibody detection. Also we have the uh, you know uh, series of purified proteins printed for the GST protein which shows the gradient and different concentration of the GST spots from the uh, lower to higher concentration which also helps us to decide that you know uh, how much protein is expressing on any given feature. The next thing comes that you know you, you have now the patient serum sample you want to apply that on the human proteomerase. Idea is what should be my best experiment which I should try to apply on the protein arrays. If we are uh, let us say having the serum with very high concentration that might get very sticky and uh, you see lot of background and non specific signal. So, you have to make the first appropriate dilution of the serum sample. Then further how long I should keep the serum on my uh, you know the slide should I keep it just for an hour, 2 hours, overnight, very long incubation just on the room temperature or doing the 4 degrees or 37 degrees variety of you know optimizations are required right. So, before you actually start applying your 100 patient sample you know it is good idea for you to optimize the signal first and that is what we try to optimize the assays. If you look at the, the left side panel on the slide the top the center image shows that you know when we are adding for the overnight incubation of the serum we see lot of non specific signals coming. So, now uh, the first image which I showed you earlier was the GST. Uh, with the uh, you know, uh, green signal and now we are showing you the uh, anti human IgG signal coming as a red signal here. So, now we are looking at autoantibody responses and there should be response which we want to detect but it should not be everywhere which is non specific. So, the middle top panel shows that there is lot of red signals which is now coming non specific throughout the slide. The bottom panel what you see like that looks pretty much clear that you know everything is not lighting up only few spots show red signal. And that is with the uh, less incubation when we have it at the room temperature. So, these kind of optimizations are very much required. Also what you want to test out when you are using the same patient sample uh, applied on two different ship how much reproducibility you can see slide 1 to slide 2. Also the spot to spot reproducibility across different ships. So, I hope you recall from my previous lecture that how much you know the QC checks are, are important right. So, now we are doing the actual project actual experiment here aim is to look at the brain tumor patients whether there is autoantibody response and can we identify some biomarkers. But before we start actual patient serum sample screening we would like to make sure our assays are working fine and the reproducibility of assay has been determined. So, on the right side you can see we have measured uh, intra chip reproducibility, inter chip reproducibility and on the bottom panel you can see we have looked at day to day variations across different type of spots and different type of chips. Once we have seen that okay, our CVs are tight, assays looks fine then only we are ready to proceed for the actual experiment. Additionally we have to also keep an eye that uh, when we are doing these assays our positive controls and negative controls they are behaving the way they should. So, for instance in this case we have uh, if we are applying the anti human IgGs. So, IgG spots which are purified immunoglobulin proteins printed on the chip they should definitely show as a positive control. And that is what you see in the in the middle here the positive control with the red spots are seen. Whereas, when we have empty spots or the spots uh, you know when we have only vector we do not have the, the genes printed on that. So, then those should be negative controls when we would not expect to see a protein expression happening and those are the one which are shown as the totally black spots which are the negative controls. So, again now you see that okay, how much we have already uh, looked carefully a variety of features before we actually start applying our patient samples and start investigating a questions of biological interest. And further once we have done all the screening then one need to look at different ways of a statistical analysis to look for that how my signals were appearing uh, before normalization. So, if you look at the, the left hand side. Uh, variety of you know different grade of patient samples they are showing different level of signals. But we need to uh, normalize all of them so that every signal now start from the same baseline and then only we are able to calculate what should be the protein expression change 
for the up regulation or down regulation. And then right side shows you the, the schematic that after doing those kind of normalization, then one could proceed for looking at the significant proteins, the best classifier using multidimensional scaling analysis and also look at various type of heat maps and find out the best classifiers. I hope now you are clear that you know what one should do before starting a project of you know the clinical interest or biological interest. So, now let me kind of walk you through a little fast, but the idea is to give you the glimpse how one could now apply this information, this knowledge of uh, doing an assay on the protein arrays for the actual patient related problem. So, I am going to talk to you about uh, some deadly brain tumors, the gliomas, meningiomas and how from the serum and CSF cerebral spinal fluid one could use the same protein array platform and look for the autoantibody biomarkers. So, I, I do not want to talk too much uh, in depth about biology of these diseases, uh, but just to reiterate that these are one of the most challenging tumors uh, which you know uh, are very aggressive in nature especially the glioblastomas uh, and these are the most commonly found uh, brain tumors especially meningioma shares the, the largest fraction of all the brain tumors. So, just to start we I am going to talk to you about the gliomas first which have the origin from the glial cells and ideally you know uh, we have the patient which are having the low grade tumors or the high grade tumors. The low grade gliomas grade 1 and 2 they are slow growing and you know they are definitely mild in nature not as aggressive as you know you will see in the higher grades. But as the disease progresses to the grade 3 and grade 4 you start seeing that the they are very malignant, aggressive and invasive nature. And then uh, eventually the glioblastoma multiforme or the grade 4 forms which are highly malignant, most aggressive and most deadly brain tumors which also shows the rapid angiogenesis, necrosis etc. The median survival of uh, these patients are, are very less sometime a year or 15 months. Uh, therefore, you know detecting these kind of diseases uh, at early stage probably can help uh, better diagnosis and better therapeutic strategies for these patients. So, for doing this project we took the patients from different grades of uh, glioma who are suffering from different uh, grades of the brain tumor, uh, the grade 2, grade 3 and grade 4. As I said grade 4s are the most deadly glioblastoma multiforme patients and we had this human proteome arrays. The first version which we used for this project was having 17,000 full length protein all of having GST tag. An idea was to apply the patient serum sample from different grades of these patients one at a time on, on each slide and then uh, you scan the images and then eventually use the image analysis for looking at any pattern emerging from these images for the different grades of tumors. So, as I mentioned that you know while uh, screening is, is not very difficult experiment one could uh, do you know 10-20 slides per day, uh, but eventually when you want to put together the hundreds of you know patient data images then the data analysis data normalization becomes very challenging and this is what we encountered here the different uh, you know grades of patients and the control we were doing in batches and then uh, before an, uh, doing the analysis we could see that you know their signals are not same. So, we did the data normalization and further after doing all the statistical analysis we found that the grade 2 patients having the less number of autoantibodies only 6 we could detect whereas, grade 3 showed the highest number of autoantibody response which is 177 and grade 4 showed the moderate numbers. So, while you know we were very surprised that why we, we could see very few number of autoantibody proteins uh, in grade 2s, but when we spoke to our clinicians and our collaborators they are not much surprised. The reason being that if you think about the brain tumors especially the gliomas they are protected with the blood brain barrier and once the tumor start growing much further and starts going to the aggressive stage of grade 3 and grade 4 then only blood brain barrier is going to breach and then many of these proteins are going to infiltrate and reach to the blood streams. So, therefore, very few proteins are ideally expected to see in the grade 2s in the blood and grade 3 should have large number of proteins and because the grade 4 everything you know body the immune system is shutting down everything is almost deregulated. So, very few changes we are seeing at the grade 4 level. So, this was actually clinically quite interesting observation and now the idea was uh, which are these proteins which we can use for our further analysis. Initially if you see these Venn diagrams there are 4 proteins which are showing uh, they are common in grade 2, 3 and 4. So, can we find some protein which are showing common uh, you know at least these are commonly present 
in all the tumor, but if there is a trend can we detect them at the very early stage because one of the idea for this project was to look at early detection biomarkers. So, after this analysis then one would like to find out can my proteins which we have identified segregate these you know the brain tumor patient with the healthy controls. So, that was the idea and we used uh, you know the multi dimensional scaling support vector machine based analysis and try to segregate the control with the gliomas. But of course, the success was not much uh, as you could see that the pattern was not very clear that you know the, con the healthy individual versus gliomas we could not segregate uh, very well based on our protein signatures. Then we started looking at can we look at control versus grade 2s, control versus grade 3s, control versus grade 4 and as we started analyzing uh, you know variety of these patterns we could see some trend in grade 3 uh, versus control and some trend in con grade 4 versus control. But of course, given the nature of the disease which is very complex it was really not expected that we can segregate it you know magically from the healthy individual to the disease individual uh, and within disease so easily that which grade the, these patients come from. Nevertheless, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we found those 4 protein which were common in grade 2, 3 and 4 and our idea was can we start investigating these proteins further and what are these proteins? So, these proteins as, as you can see on the screen, uh, one is sorting next in one protein which is uh, usually shows over expression which leads to the EGFR degradation. Lot of interesting biology is already understood for this protein. And this protein uh, uh, if you can you know, look at from the control to grade 2, you can start seeing some signal is coming from the uh, grade 2 patients and as this is progressing to grade 3 then 4, we can now see more intense signal in grade 3 then 4. So, what we are looking at? We are looking at can we find some protein which can be detected at the early stage of the tumor and that is where I think SNX1 uh, looked very interesting that you know even the, in the grade 2 patient we can start seeing those signal. If you look at IgG1, this is again one of the immunoglobulin family protein which might play some important role in the uh, immune evasion mechanism and this protein again showed a very strong signal even in the grade 2 and that remain consistent in grade 3 than grade 4. Now, other two protein which we identified is uh, EYA1 protein and PQBPA1 protein. So, EYA1 protein which is the eyes absent protein that plays an important role in the innate immune response and also in the DNA damage repair. So, it is already known to play an important role in cancer, uh, but what we are finding interesting that the level of this protein is high in the control and as the disease is progressing from grade 2, 3 and 4, the signal for these spots are going down. Another protein which was uh, polyglutamine binding protein 1 or PQBP1 protein, again if you look at their signal. Uh, from the control to the grade 4, the signal is going down and this protein is again involved in inhibiting the transcriptional activation of another protein BRN2 which is associated with development of the glial cells. So, idea is can we start looking at some of these biomarkers and look at what are their trends across other diseases as well because many proteins might be showing response which is generic response for any tumor type. So, we started looking at the level of SNX1 across other tumor type as well by looking at Oncomine database. And what we can see here that uh, if you on the right side if you look at the image that especially in the brain tumors and CNS tumor the level of SNX1 is very high whereas other tumor type uh, it is showing the, the low expression. So, definitely this could be a good marker good candidate to take it for further investigation for the clinical utility. Additionally by looking at these uh, tumor associated antigens. Uh, and we try to map them that which pathways they belong to. So, we looked at the grade 2 proteins, grade 3 proteins and grade 4 proteins that these proteins are mapped in which pathways. As you can understand that you know grade 2 we had very less number of proteins. So, we could not get some interesting pathways for that, but as the disease started progressing from grade 2 and 3 we see that you know many interesting pathways especially the you know the TGF uh, pathway, the wind signaling, such as skeletal remodeling, integrin mediated uh, cell uh, activation signals and variety of you know the androgenic receptors all of them started appearing on the interface of grade 2 and 3 and as disease started progressing more then we see there are more new pathways emerging. So, again if you look at the, the bottom panel here we have hyaluronic SA.CD44 based pathways, we have chemotaxis, neutrophil migrations and we have impaired inhibitory action of the lipoxin or neutrophil migration in CF patients. 
So, some of these are uh, showing now the disease is progressing towards the higher grades. And again if you are now uh, you know uh, look at the disease progression moving from the grade 3 and 4, now we see some new pathways emerging like IL-4 signaling pathways, HSP-60 and HSP-70 pathways. So, in turn you know while doing this analysis what we realize that some new biology uh, is appearing which we can now see that you know as disease is progressing there are new and new pathways which are also emerging based on the different candidates which we see the progressing from the low grade to the high grade of gliomas. Of course, once you have the platform and each patient you are screening individually then you can do many different ways of investigation. Now, our clinician collaborators they had interest that you know how these you know glioblastoma multiforme patient which are the most aggressive type. Uh, some of them survive better, some of them do not survive well. In some patient the tumor is very aggressive, in some tumor is not aggressive. So, how best we could uh, look at uh, this kind of profile and try to look at the impact of the location of tumor on the patient survival. So, they had some interesting observation uh, based on the radiological images and in this case as you see in the uh, on the slide we have the patients where the tumor is very close to the subventricular zone region and those are known as SVZ positive or tumor is moving far apart from the SVZ region and those are known as SVZ negative. So, SVZ positive are uh, you know they are very very aggressive tumors, SVZ negative are less aggressive tumor. So, of course, the patient survival and prognosis will be based on some of these uh, you know features and can we find out some proteins which might be interesting when we are looking at the impact of the location of the tumor based on radiology. So, in this case we identified an interesting prognostic biomarker uh, which was NED9 and NED9 is one of the neural precursor cell expressed uh, developmentally down degraded protein 9 which is involved in invasion and the cell migration. So, what we are talking right now is the same grade of the patient which are the grade 4 GBMs and within the same grade of patients some patients are having the tumor in a different location SVD positive and some in the away from the SVD region which are SVD negative. So, it is very challenging you know problem for us to address because patients have the same grade, but just a one minor change with the tumor location. Based on this we found very few protein which were actually differentially expressed from the SVD positive versus SVD negative, but this protein NED9 looked interesting and we still see some differences coming when we uh, compared for sizable number of patients within the SVD positive and SVD negative population. Additionally, we also looked at are there some prognostic markers of glioma based on the uh, mutation effects. So, IDH1 or isocetrate dehydrogenase uh, is known of the one of the very interesting uh, gene which have shown lot of mutation in the glioma patients. So, now the next investigation we want to do we already have the data from individual patients uh, from each slide. Can we now look at just the effect of these mutations on these patients and, and look at you know are there some interesting differences we see from the wild type and the mutant of the IDH uh, population. So, all these patients uh, were also uh, sequenced for the IDH gene and based on that then uh, only few patients where we could get the confirmed sequence data for IDH mutation only those we took forward for analysis based on the protein array or antibody screening. And in this case uh, we could identify almost 22 proteins, but two protein which looks very interesting were uh, YWHAH protein or uh, and STEP1 protein. So, YWHAH uh, protein that is uh, actually known to be involved in the proliferation of glioma cells and it was found to be uh, upregulated in the wild type cohort as compared to the IDH uh, positive cohort. Now, uh, it is possible that this kind of you know deregulation might be attributing toward the poor prognosis of wild type patients. So, we can conclude this part that based on protein arrays based screening in a very uh, less effort uh, one could actually do the screening of thousands of protein from the patient serum sample. Of course, the most challenging part is the data analysis part and doing the further data investigation using different type of pathway analysis and making biological sense of the data. So, doing experiments are much simpler as compared to uh, doing the further data processing and data analysis aspect. Based on these analysis we found the set of proteins especially four proteins 
uh, which looks like promising candidate for the early detection of the tumor especially from the serum sample. We also investigated the uh, effect of the tumor location based on radiology whether that could also reflect in the serum sample at the autoantibody level and one protein NET9 definitely showed promise. Additionally, we could also see some other protein like hemopexin and SOX2, HDAC7. Those are also interesting protein in to differentiate these type of SVZ behavior. We also looked at are there effect of the IDH mutation on these patients and we could see around 22 proteins were different in IDH positive and the wild type population. So, in general I hope you got a glimpse that how to perform the autoantibody screening using a patient serum sample and what is the workflow involved, how to do the data processing and finally, how to make some meaningful insight from the data set. So, this work was published uh, in uh, scientific reports uh, which was you know a, a big collaborative work from the clinicians from Patai Memorial Hospital, from some of the technologists on the protein array platform uh, from the Johns Hopkins University and of course, my team and you know variety of uh, PhD students and postdocs from IT Bombay. So, again you have to also appreciate that in this uh, kind of research you need to make good teams and you need to bring the interdisciplinary strength to really try to achieve some very uh, know, uh, interesting information which is otherwise not possible to obtain all kind of you know specialization just from uh, your own way. So, good to, to build the team which are all having the different type of strengths and then try to work on a given problem and try to see what kind of meaningful insight we can obtain. I hope you got uh, some idea that how one could use protein arrays for the biomarker discovery program and more applications are going to follow soon. Thank you.